Um, and so the second part is to have three um, short 20-minute talks or 15-minute talks with five minutes for questions from different employers throughout the region, generally very important employers. Um, so our first one is from Siena. Um, it's from Kevin Farley. I don't know him before. I just met him today, although I know many other people from Siena. And I'm looking forward to what he has to say. And I think that many of the students here, I, so, I know I told my class, <clears throat> I teach a class in lasers, you have a chance to come and hear from important people in companies telling you what it's like and how it's different from what it's been for you in the last 15 years of studying in academia. So come and hear a perspective on that kind of, what the environment's like. So Kevin. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I'm going to be presenting on behalf of uh, Siena. So Siena is a, uh, a company that services anyone who wants to ship bits around the globe. So we have uh, roughly 1,000 customers, uh, spanning from uh, the regular telcos that, you'll be, uh, that you will know, like AT&T and Verizon, Bell Canada, through to the uh, more recent uh, private networks of the likes of Google, Facebook, those types of companies. We have uh, roughly uh, just shy of $2.5 billion uh, in revenue a year, or uh, around half a billion, uh, sorry, half a million dollars per employee, because we have uh, 5,000 employees spread across 60 locations. Ten of those are research and development facilities, and uh, the, the, uh, the main R&D site being here in Ottawa, where we have uh, just over 1,000 scientists and engineers, and we're presently located uh, over towards Kanata. So uh, I, uh, I'm a senior optical systems designer, so uh, I'm supposed to give some perspective of what it's like to, uh, to be a scientist in industry, so I spend uh, a lot of my day flipping back and forth between the, uh, the time and the frequency domain, and uh, sometimes uh, I'm rotating around in Jones space, and other times I'm swimming inside the Poincaré sphere. Um, at no point in my day do I wear a suit. Um, <laughs> and um, so I've, I've, had the, uh, I've been very lucky to, uh, to be in this industry for 20 years. And uh, I started my career at uh, the Standard Telecommunications Laboratory, which was uh, you know, a great uh, institution over in the UK. And that's where uh, the, really was the birthplace of fiber optic communications, where uh, George Hockham and uh, Charlie Kao uh, first conceived of the idea. So, uh, I used to tell people when, uh, when they said, what, what is it you do? I, I'd say, well, we make really, really big telephones. And uh, my nephew used to imagine that we had giant handsets with really big buttons. Um, but telephony is not a big part of what we do these days. Uh, so I tell people now that we make the, uh, the highways of the internet. So Sienna has a, a vision of the, uh, the network in the future where uh, computing and uh, storage are available on demand through the cloud, and also that you will be able to buy on demand connectivity for that as well. So we envisage a network which is highly adaptive and uh, has interfaces that enable you to, to control it. So a lot of Sienna's uh, uh, work is around developing software to control and, uh, and operate these networks and extract value from them. Uh, the part that I work in is, uh, is in the, uh, the transport layer, so that's actually shipping photons from, uh, from one bit to the next, so, and that's what I'll try and give you a little bit of perspective about uh, that aspect of the company. So shipping bits around the world is a, is a continues to be a good business in, uh, to be in. So um, you'll all be aware of some of the uh, dizzying numbers that big science produces, like uh, you're probably you're aware that you know, CERN produces around 30 petabytes of data a year. And uh, in an increasing uh, a world where we collaborate more and more, that gets shipped between institutions um, over an optical network. 
But those numbers, even how big they are, are really dwarfed by the scale of, uh, of the communications just between uh, people. So if you, uh, you know, if you just consider video, which is a, a massive driver of uh, global bandwidth these days, and just consider, say, the, the numbers for, for one, one, uh, one company, if you look at Google's YouTube, they're seeing this year, the statistics is around 300 hours of HD video are uploaded every minute and they're getting billions of streaming downloads every day. So that drives an absolutely massive amount of bandwidth. But what I find uh, much more interesting is that we're now entering uh, a new phase where machine-to-machine -machine communications is starting to overtake that. So, uh, and this is really driven by just the sheer number of transactions. So, for example, if you look at Facebook, uh, when you click on a like in Facebook, that typically sends around about one kilobyte of information into Facebook's network. And uh, that then gets shared amongst all of their servers where they're doing analytics. So we're now in a, uh, a, a phase of uh, big data and data analytics. And there's a multiplication factor on that information of uh, somewhere between uh, 100 and 1,000. So, uh, so that's generating massive data. And uh, so our challenge at Siena really is to figure out how to ship those bits around the world at lower and lower cost every year. So um, I was asked to sort of give some perspective as uh, what it's like to be a scientist at Siena. And so I thought a bit of time about what adjective might describe that. And I think the one that kept coming back to was, we play a lot. So um, I know my, my boss is in the audience here, so I, I have to qualify that we play with the relentless pursuit of profit, Maurice. Um, <laughs> but um, we do, uh, you know, we make some pretty fun toys. So this is a toy that, uh, that's in our team. And uh, so this is a prototype optical system that, uh, that we have. And um, so we have a prototype transmitter. So this transmitter, we have uh, four 6-bit uh, to uh, digital to analog converters, uh, each running at 86 giga samples per second with uh, 40 gigahertz of electrical bandwidth. And those four DACs drive uh, four max sender modulators, which are combined in dual polarization and quadrature. So the way I sort of view that transmitter is it's, it's an arbitrary waveform generator with a bandwidth of, uh, an optical bandwidth of uh, 80 gigahertz. And you can see an optical spectrum up there of uh, something that we produced in the lab. So it's interesting to look at those on spectrum analyzers, but it's more interesting to do something with them. So we also prototype uh, optical line systems. So we have a lot of optical fiber in our labs. Uh, we have many optical systems. Um, we can, uh, our longest is uh, up to 10,000 kilometers of optical fiber in the lab. And uh, we can uh, configure that in, uh, in an infinite number of ways with optical amplifiers, with optical switches. Um, we have uh, components to uh, tailor the uh, gain spectrum. Uh, and we also have recirculating loops as well. And then at the output of those systems, we have a prototype receiver. So this contains uh, is a coherent detection. So we're able to detect the, uh, the magnitude and the phase of the, uh, of the electric field. And um, so we're able to then uh, uh, convert that into digital signals using 8-bit uh, ADCs, each running at 160 gigasamples per second uh, with 65 gigahertz of electrical bandwidth. So this system is very, very flexible, and it enables us to uh, prototype novel modulation formats, prototype novel uh, uh, signal processing algorithms. And um, it's a lot of fun, especially now that we've entered coherent communications, because now we have access to the electric field. We can, uh, we can do a lot, a lot of processing. And uh, just up on the, uh, the right there, you'll see just an example of, uh, of something that we were doing recently. This is a, uh, a multi-dimensional uh, hypersphere. Uh, constellation, and I'm just showing a projection there of uh, one polarization in the uh, Argan plane. And you can see that we have, uh, we have a very high fidelity in this test set, so we can, uh, we can produce uh, our waveforms with, uh, with over uh, 20 dB of signal-to-noise ratio. 
at, uh, across that bandwidth. So um, not everyone goes in the lab. Uh, a lot of us uh, sit at our desks and, uh, and write models and run simulations. So, um, but it's very important, you know, just as uh, you guys do in, in, uh, in your science, that we always calibrate those simulations and uh, make sure that we, we're true to ourselves. So uh, this is an example of uh, an experiment that we ran where we took uh, two, uh, two, two wavelengths, closely spaced, and then we intensity modulated one of those wavelengths with a 10 gigabit per second uh, uh, signal. And then we fired that through 400 kilometers of standard telecoms fiber. And uh, this was a very well calibrated system. And then we uh, ran simulations of the same thing. And, uh, and this was really to, uh, to validate our models of uh, simulating the uh, optical Kerr effect. So looking at the, uh, the nonlinearity of the fiber. So, uh, and we were able to get uh, 12 and a half dB signal to noise ratio line up between our simulations and, uh, and our uh, experiment. So validating that, that our, our models are correct. And uh, we, we published that. But ultimately the end goal of what we do is really is to make products, it is to make money. And um, so here's an example of a product that, uh, that I was working on recently. So this is uh, our flagship optical modem, it's called uh, WaveLogic 3. So this is where we've taken, uh, if you remember on the slide where I showed you my test bed and we had a big rack of equipment on the left that represented the transmitter. Uh, that's now been uh, integrated down into a component uh, the size of a coin. And uh, the big rack of equipment you saw on the right with uh, all of the uh, coherent receiver and, uh, and uh, ADCs is uh, integrated down to, into another small package. And those are then driven by a, a custom ASIC that we design uh, within Siena and is fabricated outside of Siena. And uh, so this, uh, the ASIC that we uh, included in this product was running uh, 70 trillion operations per second and uh, had four kilometers of wiring in an 18, square, uh, 18 millimeter square package connecting 150 million gates. So uh, that's a lot of logic, and that enables us to uh, make a, a very flexible modem. So we're able to program the modulation formats. We're able to um, uh, include uh, a signal processing on the transmit side. Uh, so we, we pulse shape to uh, confine the spectrum. Uh, so we can get very high spectral efficiency on an optical fiber. And uh, we also are able to uh, uh, process the signal that we're on the receive end. And then on top of that, we encapsulate that with uh, proprietary strong forward error correction as well. So, uh, so there's a very strong interplay in our team between uh, uh, optics and also uh, signal processing. And uh, we can do some pretty amazing things with this. So uh, we can configure it for 50 gigabits per second per wavelength and uh, go trans-Pacific distances all optically. Uh, or we can consider, uh, configure it all the way up to 200 gigabits per second and uh, transmit up to uh, 2,000 kilometers all, all optical. So uh, in addition to, uh, to making that hardware, we also uh, have spent a lot of time solving some really complex problems so as you saw, you know, uh, sort of demonstrating a, a modem going along an optical fiber. Well, we don't often, uh, we, it wouldn't, it's not cost effective to have one modem, so we will have multiple modems. Um, and uh, they will interact with each other through the nonlinearity of the fiber. But we will also uh, use optical switches uh, in the network in order to route the, uh, the uh, wavelengths around the network, so it's a mesh network. So we now end up with a, uh, a coupled set of nonlinear systems. And, uh, and these optical switches, these are, these are really cool. I, I, I really like these devices. They're basically a monochromator, but uh, in the diffracted plane, rather than putting a detector, uh, we place a, a second, but a, a, a configurable uh, diff uh, uh, diffraction grating so that we can uh, switch parts of the spectrum around the network. So this becomes a really complicated problem. So we spend a lot of time building in instrumentation. So we build in uh, optical spectrum analyzers and things like that into the network, miniaturized. 
and uh, to extract diagnostics. And then that information we feed into uh, algorithms that we use to predict performance. So, you know, uh, when you look at that test bed, that requires uh, three scientists to, uh, you know, uh, to nurse that, constantly nurse that test bed, giving it tender loving care. Um, our customers expect that uh, even though it takes hundreds of PhDs to uh, design these networks, they expect that someone with a high school education should be able to operate it and should be able to extract the, uh, the full value of the network. So, uh, so we hide a lot of complexity uh, through a simple user face, but uh, through complex algorithms underneath that. So uh, that's, uh, that's, I hope that gives you a little bit of insight. Um, I really encourage you to consider Sienna. I've found it uh, very fulfilling to work for this company. I'm constantly learning stuff. The uh, pace of technology change is, is dizzying. And uh, you never know where it's going to go, but it's always a fun journey. And uh, it's a great team to work in. It's very multicultural. And I'm constantly impressed by uh, the, uh, the knowledge uh, of the team that, that I work with. So it's a, a really great employer. You mentioned that you do some post-digital signal processing to your received signals. So as I know, there are mm, two class of methods to demultiplex the data that is transmitted. But I'm always concerned which one is prefer preferable over the other one. So I know that there are two classes, data aided and blind source separation methods. So in your mm, post-signal processing methods, which one is uh, used most of the time? So. Uh, that, that might be getting a little proprietary, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe I can come over and uh, chat with you after the presentation. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Wait. Oh. I don't know. If, um, this is just a random question. I'm not sure if. It's um, feasible in, in the near future. In the, in the, uh, uh, when will we see a transition from using electronic regenerators to all optical regenerators or electronic switching to all optical switching? Do you think that's feasible or is it uh, like... Uh, okay, yeah, thanks for your question. So, well, as I've uh, put up on the slide there, we're doing uh, trans-Pacific all optical. So there's no electrical regeneration in that at all. How about the switching? Uh, switching? So, yeah, we do do all optical switching as well. So, uh, these, uh, the optical switches that we have enable us to switch uh, configurable amounts of bandwidth in multiple paths. So, uh, so they're very flexible. Uh, what I yeah. mean more is, is like routing, not just uh, changing the... So, we're not switching at the packet level. Uh, what I mean is, the, is routing, uh, like, you know, given the address and the, like, for example, each switch knows the address and then moves to the... Yeah, so we're not doing uh, packet switching where the, uh, the, we encode the routing information within the, uh, the signal. Uh, all of the switching is uh, orchestrated from a higher level of uh, control and automation, um, but we are able to uh, switch uh, modems, reconfigure them uh, across multiple paths, uh, independently, so we're not just switching an entire spectrum, which we can independently switch different parts of the spectrum uh, across different paths of the network. Right, thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. So I'm sure we haven't exhausted all the questions, and especially if you're shy, but I believe, Kevin, you're going to be around for a while, and the poster session is a great time to find him again. Now, uh, a second large employer around Ottawa, of course, is the government and NRC. And so we have Ruth Raymond from uh, NRC, and she will speak to us for 20 minutes about what it's like to work in the government and what we're trying to do and things like that. Bonjour, je m'appelle Ruth Raymond. Je suis la directrice de recherche et développement du portefeuille TIC au Conseil national de recherche Canada. I'm delighted to be here with you today and to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing in photonics and the information communications technologies portfolio. And if that intrigues you, invite you to consider a career with the NRC. 
We've heard a lot today about anniversaries going back 100, 150 years. Well, I'm proud to say that the National Research Council is now just verging on its 100th year anniversary. We'll celebrate that in 2017. And there's an enormous number of contributions that this organization has made over that period of time to not only to Canada, but to the world. Going back to such things as the invention of canola, uh, canola oil. Did you know the CAN stands for Canada, invented at NRC? Onto the crash position indicator that's used in the black box in, air, in aircraft today, the contributions to the Canada arm on the space shuttle, and an enormous number of uh, contributions in the area of material science and uh, photonics. The information and communications technologies portfolio is just one of 12 portfolios at the NRC. We are not the only group doing photonics, as you know, in the strategic disruptive technologies is also uh, working on areas of photonics. We are in the emerging technologies division. And ICT, or its previous Institute for Microstructural Sciences, has been working in semiconductor photonics and electronics materials and component development for the last 30 years. We have been the source of num a number of uh, startups that have been generated and spin-offs of, of the organization, seven, including such companies as SIG Semiconductor. Today we're a staff of about 110, 120 research scientists, engineers, and technicians working in, in, working in the area of inorganic and organic semiconductors. So you may have heard that NRC is transforming or, or has transformed into a research technology organization. So let me just put a little bit of perspective on that and what that means. And, and to do that, I'll talk about the technology, road, um, technology um, readiness level spectrum. This was something that was developed by NASA back during the uh, space program to define a technology in terms of its readiness to launch in space in that, in that particular situation. But many variants of that have been developed since that time in terms of manufacturing readiness levels or scales that are pertinent to particular industries. So we think of that as a scale of 1 to 10 and where the technology is being developed. And if you overlay on that the innovation scale, you'll see that there's an area which is generally the purview of both government and universities in the past. And, and NRC has been that at the technology uh, levels of one to three, let's say, which is a basic or fundamental research. And then over in the, the end of the scale, let's say seven to nine area, that's where industry has been working. And in many industries, and including photonics, we know that there's a gap in the middle there of bringing that technology out into the market and making it manufacturable. So really what NRC is doing is moving into that gap. So we're now, as a research and technology organization, focusing on technology readiness levels from three to seven, say, and in our case, maybe moving up to eight, in terms of bringing focused, market-oriented, and customer-driven technologies that will benefit industry. Does that mean that we're not doing fundamental research? No, in some cases we're still continuing to do that, but particularly when there's a market drive for it and there's a clear benefit in the near term to Canada. So what are we doing in terms of photonics at Information Communications Technologies? Our largest program is the Advanced Photonic Component Program. It's a five-year program started back in 2012, so we're halfway through that program and meeting our deliverables and our milestones. And we will be and are developing new programs as we go along. A program is a very defined, uh, with defined outputs in a, in a defined period of time. So what we're focusing on here is the objectives to grow and support the Canadian telecommunications industry. And we just heard from industry as to what some of the needs are and some of the, the challenges that they have. So we're looking at clients, we're working very closely with clients who are looking at applications in data center, data center interconnect, and long haul telecommunications. We're supporting them through fabrication of high speed active devices, primarily for um, uh, high speed greater than 100, gigabit, uh, 100 gigabits per second coherent communications. We're working at the design level, the fabrication, test, and integration. And we're looking at also uh, prototyping on silicon photonics with the whole um, goal to be able to create more highly integrated, cost-effective, manufacturable, and by manufacturable, you'll hear me saying that quite a, quite a number of times, to make repeatable, uh, reliable processes that can lead to cost-effective devices. So some of the work that we're doing in the development area from, say, technology uh, readiness levels three to six is in the area of uh, on silicon, sub-wavelength structures, waveguide couplers, um, demultiplexing components, and on our, 
um, on the three fives are the active components, semiconductor lasers, modulators, and basically the building blocks that we see is this constellation of building blocks that can help our customers bring their products to market. And always looking towards that panacea of being able to integrate these into more highly complex devices. So as we go further out on the technology ready level scale, what our clients really need is that we can do this in a manufacturable way. Not just one time, two times, three times, but thousands of times to be able to demonstrate that it's manufacturable, it's repeatable, the reliability is there, and that there is a route to be able to cost reduce these over time and to be able to, um, to support them in the market. And so that's where we bring in the Canadian Photonics Fabrication Centre. It's one of the main facilities within the uh, ICT um, portfolio. We have two research fabs, um, well actually two fabs. One is a commercial foundry where we're supporting new product introduction or very, have, uh, very long way down in the, in the design chain through to manufacturing, um, volume manufacturing of devices. When I say volume, we're talking about clients that look at tens to hundreds of wafers per month. And you can just imagine in terms of number of devices that can fit on a three inch wafer, what that means in terms of volume. Uh, then we also support our Fab 2, which is our research fab that allows us to work and develop. It's much more flexible um, environment to be working on the development of new technologies, such as prototyping in silicon, silicon photonics, looking at photonic integrated circuits. Um, this is where we're also developing our C-band multi-wavelength devices that can emit at uh, more than one wavelength. Uh, gallium um, antimonide infrared lasers, and we also support our other portfolios in looking out into the future in terms of components for quantum communication and cryptography. So how's that working for us? Well, we are growing, and we're growing dramatically. So in the time since we've put this program in place and building on our strengths from the past, we have multiplied our, our interaction with clients. 45% compound annual growth rate in terms of that interaction. So we're now three times where we, uh, the size of what we were in terms of the uh, projects that we're working on. That has led to our need to grow out our staff. We've been growing out by about 15% and have even moved to multiple work shifts in order to support the fabrication of components. We've had to I increase our capacity substantially in terms of bringing in new equipment. What you can see there is one of our, our newest toys that's been commissioned in the last year, which is uh, an MOCVD epitaxial tool. And we're now um, qualifying our clients to be able to um, produce product on that tool. So that has caused us to grow, and that's an exciting place to be. So we have been, and what I've got on the right here is a list of some of the uh, positions that we have hired over the last year, 18 months, and ones that we're continuing to hire right now. And in fact, if you go on our website, you'll see some of these, many of these that are posted um, uh, in, in terms of competitions. So everything from material physics all the way down to the growth of our, our facility to be able to provide repeatable product. And we're looking at things like quality insurance, industrial engineering. So what's exciting about working at NRC, ICT? It's the ability to work on multidisciplinary teams. When we're pulling from people from the design, the materials physics, all the way through to the fabrication and production, and not only to work on a team that comes from a varied number of people from, from uh, NRC, but working in virtual teams right with our clients. So we see many clients that come in and visit us or work with us or have meetings on a weekly basis. And we've become part of that team. And it's very exciting to see what they can do with what we produce and take it out into the market and have real impact for both Canada and their companies. It's very results oriented. So we're working to get, get those technologies from the lab right through into production. So we, look, we think about things all the time like high yield designs, what's manufacturable, what's repeatable. What's the reliability going to be like? And all of these are problems that are, very, that are a great challenge to solve and involve a lot of science and physics to be able to do that. And we're always looking for that cost reduction part way, uh, pathway to be able to uh, make this viable in the market. We also get to work cross-portfolio. So I flashed by um, very quickly the uh, organization of NRC. We're working all the time with people in the aerospace, um, automotive portfolio, human health therapeutics, to be able to apply photonics to their customers and uh, the problems that their customers face. And we are creating impact for Canadian industry. Now, I, I, I love this, um, this quote here from the uh, Conference Board of Canada. 
We are working to make sure that that's no longer a secret. The secret is out, and we're running with it. And I invite you to think about that and think about being part of our team. Thank you. So Ruth, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm finishing my master's or I'm finishing my PhD in double E. Uh, I've got some experience in, I'm, I'm assuming this is the case, but, uh, <laughs> and, and, and uh, I've got some experience in clean room environments. So what kind of opportunities, um, you, you gave us a bunch of core competencies that you're looking for, that's good. So I'm assuming that I will go in the lab and, and push wafers through these tools, but if I did, in double E, many of our double E graduates uh, will have quite significant experience in the designs of, of devices. Um, is there opportunities on the theoretical size or modeling side aspect of, of the jobs? Absolutely. Um, when it, we work through right from design and modeling all the way through to test. And you know, we used to be, as you well know, the uh, you know we would produce a wafer, and the wafers would would leave from us, and our clients would do a lot of the work in terms of testing and going beyond that. We're working much more up the chain in terms of um, alleviating our clients uh, doing that and doing a lot of the test and qualification of these devices. So there's a lot of room um, in terms of. Um, uh, uh, double E. There's a lot of room in terms of material physics because solving some of these problems, as I've said, when you're trying to improve yield, comes right down to, to if it, they're, they're tough physics problems. And this is the beauty of working um, in a multidisciplinary area. So you may start in one area. You may, as you said, someone coming in with some fab experience, we'd love to have that. You start learning how to grow these wafers or how to process these wafers, and then can translate that into working in a completely other domain in terms of test. Um, we're looking at programs where we bring people in and move them through those various areas to get a, a smattering of all of the technologies and then see where their interests lie. And I think that's a tremendous opportunity for someone who may not know exactly where you want, want to be in the long run. Hi there. Um, so NRC is coming up on its 100th anniversary, um, and as a government institution, it has a, um, groups of scientists who can focus on a particular problem for a very long term, long period of time. Why is it a positive thing to move towards um, a shorter term, market driven type of research as compared to a longer term focus? For example, I mean, Hertzberg. I don't think was making lots of gadgets to sell so much, but a lot of people have profited from the, uh, his research into spectroscopy. And that's a wonderful question. Thank you for posing that because it's often you know, what, what people ask us. And it really depends on the industry that you're in and what the problem that Canadian industry is facing. So as I mentioned to you, you know, sometimes you see this gap in the technology or a gap in the development. And that affects bringing these technologies onto the market. We do see one in the photonic component area, but in many other areas, such as astronomy, for example, as you said, that may not be how we approach the problem. So we are looking at, um, at that middle technology readiness um, area in order to solve those problems. Is there an equivalent move from industry to move back into that gap as well? Because, I mean, for them who would profit most directly, that would seem to be reasonable. Um, yes, it is, but depending on what their time scales are and their ability to make the, those investments. And quite often, uh, industry may not have that ability to make the investment in terms of the equipment that would take, let's say, in the semiconductor field, um, as well as uh, uh, the profitability. So, therefore, the gap exists, and that's why we do try to fill it and work as closely with our clients as possible. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so um, my question is about how you measure success mm -hmm. in the sense that in academia, success in the brutal way is often measured in impact or publications or patents. And in industry, it's often measured in profits. So can you tell us a bit more about how you measure success at the end of the year? So that can be a difficult one. It's easy to often measure success in terms of dollars and cents, but that's not necessarily what we're looking at. Um, of course, internally, we have some of those measures, but we're looking at impact. So we look at what you know, our client success is. And clients may improve their market share. 
Now, that's not directly a monetary um, uh, success for us, but if that's what we're looking at being able to do, um, particularly you know, for, our, for our Canadian client um, base. We're looking at ensuring that the industry stays viable, and as we are right now, Canada is punching above its weight in the optical communications uh, industry and, and optical components, and we want to maintain that, and that's what we see as our role. So we can make measures in, in that regard. Of course, you do need to have revenue in order to put that back into investments, and we have measures in that way, but our real measure is the impact on Canadian industry. Thank you. Was exactly Thank you. Um, we have one more um, speaker in this set of speakers. It's Larry Taroff, and I had not met him before. So I can't give you much of a background from Larry, but Larry is going to represent a company moving to Ottawa and setting up a branch. I looked up what Jabil Optics was last night. So he'll tell us much more about this, and welcome to Ottawa. Hi, uh, my name's Larry Taroff. Um, I'm representing uh, Jabil. Uh, until I started working for Jabil, I'd never actually heard of Jabil either, um, to be honest with you. So I'd heard of Flex and Semina, but I didn't know what Jabil was until you know a couple of weeks before they hired me. And, uh, but it, it's actually a fairly large company, and I'll explain that to you um, in a minute. Uh, we are establishing um, a photonic center of excellence in Ottawa, and I'll tell you a little bit more th about that. Um, so I'm going to give you an o overview of what uh, Jabil slash AOC does, um, but really it's more, uh, hmm, this is supposed to click. What do I click? Okay. Ah, or I get to use my PhD every day. I really do. So that's, that's really the point of this talk. Um, what about Jabil? Um, Jabil was founded in 1966, so it's not really a new company. Um, you can see all the bullet points here. We've got over 180,000 employees. Uh, we've got a huge global presence that I'll show you um, in a moment. We've got large, lots of manufacturing uh, space. Um, a giant contract manufacturer will make all kinds of things, you know, from like dryers to computers to smartphones to anything you can virtually think of that, that somebody would, would farm out and manufacture in volume. Jabil probably manufactures it. Uh, so that, that's, that's what the company in its biggest incarnation does, which probably has very little to do with what you folks are interested in when you're studying on your, um, uh, this is graduate students, right? When, when you're working on your master's and your PhD at this point in time. Uh, so I'll come to that. Uh, we've got um, over 90 sites in, does that say 23 countries? It's 28 countries. Um, every time I see a version of the zoo graph, the number of countries ch changes. So I'm not really sure what the latest is, but we're in a lot of places around the globe. Um, you can see the bullet points in terms of that. Um, but the key point here, whoops, there was a key point here. We've recently established the uh, Ottawa Photonics uh, Center of Excellence. So uh, that's something I would like to spend a little bit of time talking with you about today um, at some point. Uh, one of the things that Jabil does uh, when they acquire certain companies, um, Jabil uh, tends not to grow things organically all the time. They tend to do things through acquisitions sometimes. And sometimes those acquisitions are so well known within their particular niche maybe not to you, but within their particular niche, uh, that they retain their same branding. So it'll be, for example, um, Greenpoint, a Jable company, or Nipro, uh, a Jable company, and AOC is also retaining um, its own brand name. Uh, I'm gonna switch gears for a second, and I'm gonna talk about small company versus large company, because um, coming to the crossroads of getting your graduate degree, you wanna figure out what you wanna do. Um, there's a little bit of heresy in here, and there's a little bit of, um, uh, so there's infrastructure implications, and it didn't go across the lines. Um, in a small company, uh, there's minimal, uh, and if there's no infrastructure, you've got to basically go do everything yourself. You are the chief cook and bottle washer, um, and you have to get that all done. Uh, one of the things that a large company can do is supply you with infrastructure, so you work on the things that, that are really value-added for you to work on, um, and uh, let all the rest of the junk go to uh, somebody, somebody else to deal with. Um, you know, it still isn't working. Okay, inertia. In a small company, uh, you get to move as fast as you can. That's part of the, that's part of the statement about working in a small company. Um, and the usual knock on large companies is that, you know, they're big, they can't move, they can't do anything. But the truth is that if you are in uh, a small group that knows how to move fast, uh, you can. Um, I've got my theory of fractals, uh, which I'll just sh uh, spend uh, with you for a minute. Uh, to me, there's no such thing as you know, a small company, a large company. A large company is composed of groups and composed of people. And within any given group, um, you've got the ability to have any rate of inertia that that group collectively decides to do. In our particular case, we really do decide that within 
uh, the giant table, our group really does decide to move fast. And so uh, we like to think of ourselves as a small company within the infrastructure of a larger company. And I know other companies that do the same sort of thing. I'm, I'm sure that you know Kevin feels that way within Sienna. I know I felt that way at certain times within certain parts of Nortel, which later got absorbed by Sienna. Uh, and so um, other times not, but... <laughs> But uh, so the, the, the inertia thing, it really is dependent on the group that you're in. And when you're considering your career, you want to get some sense at interview time or whatever, basically how fast do things move? If I have an idea, can I bring it to fruition? What do I need to uh, bring it to fruition? If the answer is I need to go through, you know, 20 committees, jump through hoops and, you know, uh, solve health and safety down at the mayor's office, you're not going to get very far very fast. If, on the other hand, somebody says, well, what you really have to do is sell us on the business case and the idea and we'll run with it. That's the answer that you want to hear at the time of interview. And um, at AOCJ, but we kind of do that. Um, team. Um, in a small company, you've got a small, motivated team uh, which has to do everything. Um, in a large team, as Ruth was talking about the cross-disciplinary, you're able to draw from a lot of different areas um, according to the need at the moment and according to the project. And uh, that uh, basically uh, helps you. That's one of the things that a large company can do that a small company can't do. Um, Influence. When you're in a small company, you are a big fish in a small pond. You feel very, very important. Um, I know I've been in small companies, I've been in big companies, and I've always been made to feel very, very important in a small company, whether we are or aren't doing anything. Um, in a large company, it is really easy to be um, a small fish in a big pond. So the question is, um, and this is kind of up to you to manage your own career, are you... Uh, are you a large fish in a large pond, or are you a cog? It's really easy to be a cog, but you can also be a large fish. It's kind of up to you and the initiative you take in your own career. Um, direction. Uh, in a small company, uh, you figure it out. Uh, in, uh, in a large company, you're given broad scope, and then you figure it out. So really, your career management is up to you, whether you're in a small company or a large company. Um, and one of the bullet points that's missing down below uh, here somewhere. Um, I was talking about uh, career development. So in a small company, there's no such thing um, as career development. Whereas in a large company, um, it's not so much whether you do or don't move up the corporate ladder, and a lot of people don't really care about this at this point in time. Um, it's really more, um, to Ruth's point, uh, basically I was an MOCVD grower one day, and now I want to be a device designer, or now I want to do tests, or that sort of things. Be because the more disciplines you can bring to uh, your own level of mastery, the more weapons you have to bring to bear on a particular problem uh, that even an interdisciplinary team can't do, if you've got all these different things in your head, you can forge a unique solution to a problem that um, others would find it hard to do. And a large company environment, when done correctly, when done in a really good way, um, is, is, is a force for good for doing this sort of a thing. So now, just, just some details about some of uh, the companies uh, within JBIL. So uh, Greenpoint, which retained its name, they, uh, Greenpoint does uh, consumer wearables, uh, but they also do uh, defense and aerospace thing. Um, if you're a pacifist, you may not want to be part of the defense and aerospace group, but um, there's, there's a lot of uh, hard physics that goes in. I want to echo something that both uh, Ruth and Kevin were saying, is that in any of these sorts of things that, uh, you know, but a high school student or but an infant can do. There is so much hard physics buried into how to do this stuff. And you know, as you guys are graduating, you're gonna be a part of that. And when you go to parties with people, it's gonna be hard to explain to people what you're doing, what the impact is, and just not know that that is a consequence of the lifestyle that you've chosen when you do this kind of stuff that I'm seeing on the posters here. Yeah, ex yeah exactly, you're all, but, but it's really rewarding to be a part of that. Um, and then uh, Nipro, which is another Jable company, uh, more in the medical area. And um, I won't go through all the bullet points, but you can, you can get a flavor of what that's done. All of this is possible within Jable, and some of these people will draw on areas from different uh, areas of the company to solve a particular problem. There's the Blue Sky Center, which is located in San Jose, California, which is kind of a showpiece for the company. Uh, and uh, you know, it's got a, it's it's got demonstrations of 3D printing, uh, various things with processing. There's a really cool robot arm demonstration that's done by uh, one of the companies and clients within Jable. Um, there's a clean room, of course. Stack Velocity is open source uh, computing that some of you, and uh, you know, we too see the Internet of Things uh, driving the way forward. Uh, to a question that was asked earlier, basically, what do you see as disruptive technologies? Um, it's true that you th you can think in terms of disruptive technologies, but we really need to think. I feel is in terms of um, more the drivers of that disruptive technology. And the Internet of Things is probably one of those drivers of the technology that was, that was shown on Kevin's view graphs as well. So 
it's really all about what is the problem statement and then what do you do collectively um, either as a large uh, as, as an interdisciplinary team within a company or as a group of companies, uh, because we do live in a very interconnected uh, community these days uh, to, to attack that problem. Um, this is just some details about AOC, which has been acquired by Jabil. Um, you can read the bullet points here. Uh, that's the Wuhan manufacturing facility there. Um, you can, uh, I, I won't go through all the details, but uh, we're basically uh, working in, in a telecom sort of space here. Uh, one of the things, uh, AOC does a number of things, and we're going to do a number of things. Uh, there are some things that we do are proprietary because they're for particular customers. Uh, when you're a contract manufacturer, or in our case, we think of ourselves as a photonics foundry, uh, we're, we're providing value added to our customers, which means we don't declare everything that we do for um, our customers, uh, but we can, we can talk about, for example, the EDFA work that we do. Um, we, these are in cartoon form, uh, but basically showing some of the market segments that we address. Um, Kevin did a particularly good job of showing some of the 100 um, and, and, and up space. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, really hard physics buried in basically how do you do this. Um, there was a question tangential to a question earlier um, and, and a response earlier. Um, it's a question of basically what technology do you use for a particular problem? Now that sounds like motherhood, but it's basically marrying the um, the duality of the cost to either bring or maintain a particular technology to market with what the market can bear for that. So for example, if you're trying to move things from this end of the room to that end of the room, you can't afford to spend as much money per bit as if you're trying to do the transoceanic things that, uh, that Kevin was doing. And so the particular aspects of the technology that you do bring to bear have to be done with this in mind. And there's a lot of hard physics to trying to get a solution that isn't the best physics solution that you can get, but is the best overall cross-disciplinary, make it into a product manufacturing solution. And there's, there's a lot of satisfaction in being able to do that. And at Jabil, that's one of the things that we do. Um, this, is, uh, this is an example. Um, you've, you've seen this sort of thing in some of the other presentations. There's a bunch of optical building blocks. Part of the point of this view graph is that uh, we live in a world right now, uh, once upon a time, uh, we were talking about basically having to uh, make more and more transistors uh, per chip. You know, we've all heard of uh, Moore's law. Moore actually hates the concept of Moore's law, but there, 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 there it is, which means basically an exponential increase in the number of transistors through basically the decrease in the gate size of that transistor. But you really have just one element, the transistor. In the optics field right now, we have multiple devices that we can use to bear on the problem. Uh, so Kevin was showing um, a DSP solution that had 150 million gates on it, which is like, just think about that, at least for me who's grown up with this stuff, that is a staggering amount. To you, it's just a data point, but to me, knowing you know where things were 20 years ago or whatever, that's just a staggering number of gates. Right now, um, the, the high watermark for a number of elements on um, an optical uh, equivalent would be about 1,000. So we are several orders of magnitude behind in the optics, and it's a question of, uh, to one of the points that was raised earlier, it's basically how do you or do you even want to catch up? If you do catch up, what does that look like and what is the infrastructure surrounding it? So uh, when Ruth is talking about things like PDKs, physical design kits, and all, these are things that, um, she didn't bring it out, but it was on her view graph. Uh, these are things that you need to be able to do. This is some of the infrastructure that you need to support that within the industry. And there are people who work on this sort of stuff too. Um, this is one particular device. Um, and this is just sort of to show some of the cool physics that you can do. Uh, Okay, this, this uses, um, this is basically to show how uh, the Pockels effects work within this particular device, which actually is a polarization rotator that you can turn into a modulator. Um, another piece of cool physics here is the, is the traveling wave, uh, because the uh, refractive index of the optical waveguide, that's one, that's, that's one refractive index, but the speed at which the pulse travels down the device is a different, and so we've, um, you know, the industry has had to come up with the so-called traveling wave device, which is another really cool piece of physics. So in this one device, um, you get to work with all these different uh, areas of physics in just one device, and you know, I could have easily shown another device and talked about the cool physics you do with that device. Sorry, yeah, okay, um, pretty close. Um, how do I use my PhD every day? This is probably something you're interested in. Um, you know, I, I get to consider uh, design, processing, reliability analysis and solve problems um, at both the device and the module level. Um, at the module level, you consider the individual elements, uh, what are the interactions between the elements um, and solve problems. Um, 
one really cool thing about uh, being in this industry is ongoing learning. Uh, we get to self-learn uh, because we're all bootstrapping ourselves as to whatever the next technology is, the stuff that's going to be in your university course five years from now. So that is one really, really cool thing about it. Um, and then uh, in terms of strategic work, um, what, do, what do our customers really need? Uh, what can the combined might of our company make? Um, how can we differentiate from our competitors? And what secret sauce can we do by this whole business of interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, drawing on different areas of the company? And that's it. Pardon? So uh, as a part of your new center, how many new people are you looking to hire? First question. And second question is related. Money matters. So. Uh, we all like physics, but money matters at the end of the day. What's your remuneration uh, uh, scale? I'm not going to talk to you about. I, I'm not going to talk to you about our remuneration scale. I can't. I can't do that in public, obviously. Um, you know, I would say I would say that we're competitive, and any other company that you ask to speak in public would say that you know we're competitive, and that's really all I can tell you. Um, oh, sorry. Num num number of people we're looking to hire. We're looking to grow. Um, that's that's a good question. Uh, you have a plan, and then the plan always morphs. And, and right now, the plan looks like we're, we're growing even faster than we thought that we were going to. So we're going to be adding you know, somewhere between 10 and 20 people this year just to the auto group alone. The company as a whole is going to hire a pile of people. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I'm just wondering, out of curiosity, uh, if you have any optical signal processing, and do you have, uh, like, uh, is there any real optical memory yet uh, that that's uh, usable, <laughs> like commercial? That's a good question. I can't really, I'm not an expert in optical memory, so I couldn't really speak to that. Uh, I, I could make up a story, but I... Um, I couldn't really um, answer it. Optical signal processing, I mean, of, of, of course people look at that. Um, is it a mainstay of the stuff that we're doing right now? I wouldn't say that it necessarily is. Uh, 